in 2020, because of COVID-19, traveling is out, but there's no reason you can't meet old and make new friends at an Agile conference. The Scrum Master Toolbox podcast teamed up with Tom Henriksen to organize the fourth year of the Agile Online Summit, and you can attend for free. There will be networking events, lots of talks on important topics, and eight amazing keynotes from Mary Poppendick to Alan Holub, Jeff Patton, who's the creator of user story mapping, Neil Killick, who's a no estimates pioneer, Jeff Watts, author of Scrum Mastery, a great book for Scrum Masters, Jeff Gotthelf, Bob Galen, and our very own Marcus Hammerberry, who's the author of The Bungsu Story, a great agile transformation story. You can get your free tickets at bit.ly forward slash S-M-A-O-S 2020. All lowercase, all one word, once again, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash S-M-A-O-S 2020. All lowercase, all one word, and the link is also on the show notes. You can get your free ticket or opt for the full digital access that lets you keep all the conference videos forever. And for example, organize agile learning sessions at work by watching those videos. You can get the full digital access at bit.ly forward slash SMAOS 2020. But don't forget, there will be lots of live networking events. So I'll see you at the conference floor. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast, uh, which uh, this week has a uh, guest from high places, Adrienne Rinaldi. Hi, Adrienne. Welcome to the show. Hello. How are you? How about that? Do you like the introduction? (laughs) (laughs) Yes, I love it. Thanks for having me. So, so, uh, Adrienne, which city are you in? Um, I currently am in a suburb of Phoenix, Arizona. All right. Very good. So Adrienne Rinaldi is an Agile Transformation Coach and co-founder at Pinnacle Tech Consulting. She has a passion for topics such as emotional intelligence in Agile leadership, cultural transformations, and breaking the norms in hierarchical organizations. She has enabled value-based strategy and business agility at many levels of client organizations, teams, programs, and portfolios. And uh, when not being an agilist, Adrienne's activities uh, include a published book about beer and yoga, that's very interesting, mountaineering, that's why I said high places, and hiking. Uh, She's a Colorado 14er finisher, did I pronounce that correctly? It is, 14er finisher. 14ers, um, I guess it's a slang word, but it means mountains above 14,000 feet. Wow. So indeed, a guest in high places. So Adrian, that was a short intro. So tell us a little bit more about yourself and uh, how did you end up becoming a Scrum Master? Well, um, many years ago, I was working at a small startup uh, managing custom websites and native and web applications. Uh, Since we were building custom software incrementally, the company provided Scrum Master certification training to all the project managers. And so my agile journey began. Absolutely. And uh, project management background is something we've heard quite a lot about here on the podcast. I myself am uh, what I used to call or what I usually call a recovering project manager. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, recovering project manager. Because you you never forget it, right? It, It stays with you forever. Oh, I try to forget it all the time. Yeah, that, that exactly. That's the recovering part. <laughs> all right, Adrienne. So, so let's dive into it. So, as as a project manager, and then of course the evolution as a, a scrum master, agile coach, and and working with clients. I'm sure there are many ups and downs, and of course on Mondays we like to explore some of those not so happy moments because they bring a lot of learning and growth with them. So tell us a story, Adrienne, of a moment where you, as a scrum master or as an agile coach, you did your best, and at that time, just it wasn't good enough, right? And you learned a lot from that. So share that story with us, Adrienne. Sure. Um, a few years ago, I was working with a consulting company, with a healthcare company, as a scrum master for a data warehouse team. Uh, the group was so disconnected. It was very, very difficult, almost nearly impossible to get the team to work together. The, the business product owner would constantly miss meetings without notice, did not 
take or make the time to create stories, would constantly dictate to the development team, but then would make changes uh, during demos, saying that she didn't want that, and unfortunately would yell at the people in the meetings. Ouch. Um, it was in- incredibly embarrassing to be a, a part of that team and have very little impact um, in, in behaviors. Um, additionally, the architect would not give direction to the team. They, they were very much set up for, for failure, unfortunately. Um, communication was also funneled through a development lead because the team was so overworked with too much whip, not enough capacity. They would not stand up to the product owner because of her title and tenure with the company. I couldn't get any backing to have the product owner and the architect create a healthy backlog. You know, their excuses were they had been with the company for 25 years and and they didn't work in agile as I'm putting up quote marks. Um, You know, sprint after sprint, I, I tried to work with the team to create a healthy backlog size stories, build out sprints based on capacity, and it failed every single time. I even started to dread facilitating meetings. The team was not completing demoed work, or they weren't demoing completed work because they would get backlash from the product owner. And after seven months of this, it wasn't that wasn't a short period of time. After seven months, they still did not have a, a working portal that was usable to customers. I I felt personally like it it was a huge failure because I was not able to get the team to work together and create working software. That was was very difficult (laughs) as a scrum master. Yeah. You you said something there uh, that I I, I think it's important to highlight and and maybe to to explore a little bit more. You said uh, the team was very much set up for failure. When you look back now with the benefit of hindsight and a little bit of distance as as it uh, normally is useful when it comes to reflection what do you think were those conditions that actually set up the team for failure describe those for us yeah i think when larger organizations go through an agile transformation or they're adopting agile a lot of people, um, especially people who have been with organizations for many years and they have not experienced other organizations and how they work, uh, they become very scared that perhaps their their job is in jeopardy or they're afraid to learn new things. And maybe they don't even know that. But when that happens and everybody is not on board to adopt something new like agility or whatever framework it may be, whether it's a scaling framework or or just adopting agile, then if not everybody is willing to make the team successful, then they're automatically set up for failure. Yeah, absolutely. That That's one of the things with teams, right? It's not enough one person wanting it, the whole team needs to want it. Um, now, for, for those of us that are out there, maybe kind of getting the hint that the team is uh, maybe afraid of losing their jobs. Maybe the product owner is afraid of losing their jobs. Like what, when you look back at what do you wish you would have done in that situation? Um, I wish in that situation that I would have been more assertive and I have, I, I'm, I'm very, I'm a very assertive person, but um, when you are working through a consulting company and are placed somewhere, whether it be a scrum master or a coach or a product owner or whatever it is, you don't have as much authority. You're sometimes not thought of as a team member, so your opinions don't matter potentially to people who actually work in the organization. Um, so I think that's a very difficult place to be, but I still wish that I would have, you know, put more of a a servant leader or coaching hat on and been more assertive in saying, if we do this, this way, then the team can be more successful. It is a little bit, uh, the responsibility, perhaps the forgotten 
responsibility of the scrum master to kind of serve a little bit like a, a, a lighthouse, right? It's it's not enough to be just there and, and try to help, but it, it's also important that we, we set the direction and maybe bring up the dysfunction and not necessarily handle it, but work with the team and the stakeholders to figure out whether they even want to handle the dysfunction. In, in this case, you mentioned several, right? And and we could pick one and, and just bring it up and have a conversation about it or, or just acknowledge that the conversation isn't possible and that's okay. And then we need to move on. Yeah, I, I do like your lighthouse analogy. That's exactly, exactly right. We not only need to be the, the light, but also the direction. Absolutely. Well, that's, that was a great story. Thank you very much for sharing that with us, Adrienne. Yeah, thank you. Monday is about what we learn from our obstacles and our failures. But tomorrow is Team Tuesday here on the Scrum Master Toolbox podcast. We explore teams and their journeys, the habits they develop that threaten their performance, how each of our guests help their teams evolve, and the one key lesson they learned from that experience. We really hope you liked our show. And if you did, why not rate this podcast on Stitcher or iTunes? Share this podcast and let other Scrum Masters know about this valuable resource for their work. Remember that sharing is caring. 